in verses 22 and 23, Peter writes, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love for the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So Peter has been writing in chapter 1 of the reality of what we would today refer to as a transformed life. And the point he's been making up to this place has been that that when you're really saved, uh, your life is going to be transformed, which will be an evidence that you actually have experienced salvation. You see, your life is going to be transformed, and the way you lived at one time is now going to be diametrically different than it was in the past. When you didn't have a fear of God, you lived in a certain way. Now that you have a fear of the Lord, you live in a way that honors Him. And as a a reality of that, uh, you are going to be producing good works. Your life is going to be um, demonstrating this fear and this love of God. Somebody said, though we're justified by faith alone, the faith that justifies is never alone. And that's because it always produces a transformed life a life that produces good works. Now, when Paul was writing, Paul spoke of becoming new creations, and he had said, all things have become new. Then the all things that he speaks of, all things have become new, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, would include the way that we live. In Ephesians, he had written in chapter 5, verse 8, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk, he says, as children of light. So a transformation has taken place, And they now have a desire to know and to please God. Ezekiel, in chapter 36, verse 26, gives a promise that God gives. It says there, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So as Peter's been writing concerning this new life, a life of salvation, a life of a person who knows the Lord, he has said that it's, it's revealed by various things. It's revealed, he says, in uh, verses 15 through 17. It's revealed in holiness, he says, in a fear of the Lord. He said in verse 15 of chapter 1, As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it's written, Be holy, for I am holy. If you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. And so the new life is revealed by holiness, it's revealed by the fear of the Lord, but it is also revealed by love for the brethren. Love for other believers is the earmark, it's the birthmark that reveals that we have been saved. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8, it says, Beloved, let us love one another because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So love is the earmark of a believer. It it identifies us as God's children. Now, some will say, well, it's easy for you to say because you don't have to live with the people I live with. And for that, I thank you, Jesus. (laughs) Well, you don't have to like somebody, but you do have to love. It has been commanded And loving others is the earmark. It is the birthmark, if you will. You see, we we are able to love others, not simply by willing ourselves to do so. That doesn't work. We can love others by the power of the Holy Spirit. And by dying to ourself, and as we seek God, we can learn to love. In Romans 5, verse 5, it says, Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we're a family. We're a family in Christ. He loves us, and we love one another. In 1 John 3, 23, this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us suggestion. No, as he gave us commandment. It's not a suggestion. I was sharing with a friend of mine just this uh, last week. I was speaking to him a little bit, and I said, you know, um, you can be in a a fraternity in college or a sorority, if you will, and it is not required of you to love the fellow members of that fraternity or that sorority. You can be in law enforcement, and there's no 
command. They, they cannot keep you from being in law enforcement uh, if you don't love your fellow officers. It, it, it doesn't matter. It, it, you're there for the job. You can be a firefighter. You, you, you don't take an oath to love one another. You can be part of uh, so many different things, lodges, you name it. You can be part of athletic teams, anything that requires you to work with other people and sometimes numbers of other people. And there's no requirement for you to love. But there is only one group of people on the face of the planet that is commanded to love one another, and that's the church. We are commanded to. We cannot treat the church as if it's a club. We can't treat the church as if it's some fraternal organization. We can't treat each other in that way. We're to love one another. And that's the point he was making. He says that we are to love one another. Notice again, he says in verse 22 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. You have purified your souls. How did you do that? Well, by obeying the truth. You yielded to the requirements that God has given to you. In Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So obedience has resulted in a completely new life. And this is our part in our new life, which is obedience. Obedience to his command. In Psalm 119, verse 9, a question is asked, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? How can I live a life that is purified by listening to and living by God's word? That's why James 1.22 says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And so Christians are to have love. Now, I want you to notice this. I'll show, show you something that I find interesting. Notice when he says, again in verse 22, you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. Sincere love. Um, the Latin for sincere is sincera. Sincere, sincera. Uh, that literally means without wax. Interesting. Why would that be without wax? What does that mean? During the time of the writing of the Bible, you might go to a shop, and as you go to the shop, you're looking for pottery. And you'll, go, you'll look at the pottery that's out in display. And as you're looking at the pottery there in the shadows, you can look at it, and it looks fine. You can spin it around in your hand. But what you would do is you would turn it and look at the bottom. And the bottom would say, Sincera. Without wax. Why would it be without wax? Because there sometimes would be hairline fractures in that, in that vase or whatever it is. And if you lifted it up to the light, you would see that. And what people would do is they would take wax and they would wax over the break. And so the real deal was sincera. And so the love that we're to have is to be the real deal. It's not that, hey, brother, I love you, man. And then later on, that guy's a dork. I don't like that guy. <laughs> it, it, it's unfeigned. That's what the word means. The word sincere means to be without hypocrisy, without ulterior motives. Love for some is filled with hypocrisy. Love for some is simply a word that they use when they want to get something from somebody else. They pretend, in other words, to to love somebody in order that they might win them over, make them their friend, so they can use this person and their popularity to climb a ladder of success. And there are people who say, oh, I love you, bro. I really do, but they're climbing a ladder. For others, love can be a weapon. Love can be used to hurt or to control. It even can be withheld and be used to punish somebody else. When you're a kid, and I've got a few people who think you're kids, so I'll talk to you right now. When you're a kid, you learn one lesson. I learned this lesson when I was in my teens. The one who loves least has the most power. The one who loves least. Now, what do I mean by that? As a kid, as a boy, I might have a girl that kind of, I hear, likes me. You know, that way, you know, do you like me? I like you. Or they send you a little note and it says, 
Fine. Do you like me? Yes, no, check the box. Maybe, you know. <laughs> and so, yeah, I like you. Or, or, you know, she'll send one of her girlfriends over. You know, Shirley really thinks you're cute. And then you, then you have a chance to say, woof, woof. Uh, <laughs> Now you say, oh, really? Do you think she's cute? You know, we used to play that game in high school. And when you discover that somebody really, really likes you, then people like me would take advantage of that. If you liked me more than I liked you, I could control you. And a lot of men still play that game to this day. They use love as a weapon. They withhold it. To control. The wife has yielded herself in every way to this man, and he just holds a little bit back. That way he can be a jerk whenever he wants to and apologize. And she'll always say, I'm okay, I accept it. That's the worst thing we can do. Some people do that. For others, the word love is used in reality, it's not love at all, it's simply lust. They use the word in order to take advantage. None of that is love. What that is is what the Bible simply calls the works of the flesh. So those who have purified souls love with a sincere and a pure heart. Now, when he speaks of it as being a pure heart, a sincere a love and all of that, when there's a purified scene, verse 22, you've purified your souls. When it speaks of a purity, a purified soul, a, a sincere, pure heart, it, it speaks of that which is clean. Uh, it imparts no uncleanness. It's a picture of a vine that has been cleansed by pruning, and it's fitting to bear fruit. It's not the result of positive thinking. It's not the result of trying hard. The purity of our heart is a result of abiding in Jesus Christ. And so he speaks of it in verse 23, and continuing by saying, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides Forever, So when he speaks of this, having been born again, not of corruptible, but of incorruptible, incorruptible that, that is contrasting natural birth with spiritual birth. Corruptible seed is speaking of natural birth. It's how a father initiates human life. In contrast, God initiates spiritual birth with imperishable seed, and that imperishable seed is the word of God. And he's saying that we're born again through God's word, and God's word lives and it abides forever. God's word is the agent of regeneration. It's God's word that is received by faith and is acted upon by faith that saves you. In John 6, 63, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak, Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and their life. In James 1.18, James said of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. How were you born again? Well, you heard the word of God as it was proclaimed. The Holy Spirit of God convicted you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You repented of your sin. You asked God for forgiveness. The Holy Spirit came to dwell within you because by faith you received that, that sin offering that was given on your behalf when Jesus laid his life down. The Spirit now dwells within you. You have become the temple of the Spirit of God. And you have been what the Bible says is regenerated. That's how you got saved. It wasn't by works of righteousness. But it was His mercy. This week, when I was in New York, a second service, um, the pastor of the fellowship, his name is Bobby, Bobby came and grabbed me and he said, he said I want you to meet somebody and there was a, uh, a 92-year-old woman, beautiful woman, beautiful woman. She didn't look a day over 91. I mean, she was, <laughs> no, she was a beautiful, beautiful woman, real sweet. And she had a little cane, a little Italian woman. She had a cane. And, and Bobby said, she wants to talk to you. And she, 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 she was a Catholic for all of her life. And she said, today the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And I'm, I'm telling you, what a blessed thing. It is, amen, amen, overwhelming applause, but it's true. <laughs> you know, it's funny, in, in, in the church I was in, in New York, apparently Bobby told me this. 
He said, they do not clap. They just sit there. And so first service, it's kind of trippy. So first service, you know, I said something, whatever. And one person got excited, and he heard. And I said, wow, that's overwhelming, you know. And, and, and then, and then this other people, I guess they got embarrassed. I wasn't asking for applause. I was teasing them. But second service, it, it happened again. And they said, you know, first service, yeah, they had one or two people. You guys are really alive. And it was interesting. <laughs> But it is exciting to see a 92-year-old woman saying, the Holy Spirit spoke to me today. And so as he continues on, he says, it's the word of God that lives and abides forever. And because the word of God is alive forever, we have because of the word we live forever too in Christ. He goes on, he says in verse 24, all flesh is as grass, the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So you see somebody as you're a kid, you grow up and he's a hero to you, we'll say an athlete of some sort, you know, some power lifter or some bodybuilder or some boxer or some fighter, whatever it may be. And uh, you see them as a young man and they're in incredible shape and you say to yourself, boy, one day I'd like to work out and be built like that. You know, it's never going to be possible because it's just not in the way your body is, is. But you admire that. And then you see them 50 years later. And it's just true that, that that chest that they had is now their waist. It's just, a, it's just interesting. You know? <laughs> Mankind in all its glory has a limited amount of days. It's Psalm 103, 15 and 16. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. The wind passes over it. It's gone. And its place remembers it no more. He says, but, verse 25, the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is a word which by the gospel was preached to you. And so the gospel of Jesus Christ endures at all times, in all seasons, forever. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will by no means pass away God has promised to give us new life, and he does it through the gospel. Jesus in John 5, 24 said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word, believes in him who sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. By faith, we've been saved. We have believed we've received God's word, and God's word has produced life in us and cannot be rendered ineffective. And it's this word, it's the gospel that has produced spiritual life in us. And so as he's speaking about this, he goes on, and as a result of this, if this has happened, therefore, verse 1, chapter 2, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious." Seeing that you're born again, this is how you should live. This should be your new life. Now, the vices that he speaks of, the sins that he names, are the kinds of things that destroy a community. These are sins that actually destroy a church. They produce what is called division, and they divide the church. And bro brothers and sisters, they, they, they have nothing but arguments and anger towards one another. So he's saying, listen, love with sincerity be real. Be authentic. If God really grabbed hold of you, live like he did. And if he grabs somebody else, then treat them as somebody new. Love them. Love them for Christ's sake. Now, he says something. And I want to show you something. He says, these are sins. These are sins that should be laid aside. Notice verse 1 in chapter 2, laying aside. When he says laying aside, that's speaking of removing. It's like if you've been working out in the, in, in, in the yard all day and it's hot and, and you've been perspiring and you've been working in the dirt and, and all, when you come in the house, you lay it aside. You, you take these things off. You remove that soiled clothing. It, it speaks of a personal decision. It speaks of discipline on your part. You see, these things aren't automatically eliminated. They don't simply go away because you were born again. They have to be voluntarily forsaken. It has to come through a decision of the will where you say, this is not pleasing to you. 
and I don't want it. Paul in Colossians 3 verse 8 said it like this. He said, put off all these anger and wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. We have uh, swearing saints now. Sometimes in the pulpit, you have people using profanity. He says, put these things aside, this filthy language. Get rid of it. In Ephesians 4, and 23, he says, put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So what do I put off? Because he says, laying aside. Well, he says, lay aside malice. The word malice speaks of the desire to hurt somebody. Lay it aside. It's been said that malice is the force that destroys fellowship. You see, if we allow ourselves to yield to malice, then the love that we should have for others, including that person that we've been hurt by, well, that love is going to be quenched. That's why in Ephesians 4.31, Paul said, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So we're not to harbor malice for other people. It's easier said than done. Because if somebody has hurt you and hurt you especially, hurt you deeply, you know, you might find yourself thinking, you know, Lord, please save them and then kill them. (laughs) Christianity is... Is, is not the easy life. I had a guy I used to work with. His name was Gus. And, and he and I were talking on one occasion at work. And, and as we were talking, I had shared with him my faith in Christ. And after I'd shared more than once with him at work, we were talking at lunch. And he said, well, you, you took the easy way out. I said, what do you mean, the easy way out? And he said, you became a Christian. You took the easy way out. And I smiled at him. I said, you don't know what it means to be a Christian, Gus. It's a lot easier for me to get angry than it is for me to live in peace. It's a lot easier for me to tell you what I'm thinking right now, you stupid idiot. (laughs) (laughs) Than to be kind to you. You know what I mean. It's easier to retaliate. And it's easier to hold a grudge. And it's easier to hope that evil happens to somebody than it is to bless them in the name of the Lord. Jesus said uh, in Matthew 5, 44, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Put this aside. Like filthy clothes, lay it aside. Why? It pollutes, it destroys He says, lay aside guile and hypocrisy. Lay aside insincerity. Insincerity or guile, it is is deceit with the appearance of truth. It's it's a hypocritical kind of thing. You're insincere. You're presenting yourself in a certain way, but in fact, you're not that way. It's pretense. Uh, It it, it is especially revealed when somebody's doctrine... The things they say they believe doesn't line up with the way that they live. You know, what you are speaks so loudly, it's been said, that I can't hear a word you're saying. You know, that old phrase, practice what you preach. It's it's easy for me to tell someone how to live. It's much easier to tell them how to live than for me to live in the way I'm telling them, that kind of thing. Because when I'm telling somebody to do something and I myself practice the opposite, that's hypocrisy. And so that's revealed that way. Insincerity and hypocrisy are destructive. They're especially ugly when performed by those who profess to be followers of Christ. And so he's saying, love one another and speak truth sincerely. He says, lay aside envy. Envy is discontent and resentment because you want something that somebody else has. You know... Somebody gets a new car in your neighborhood and, they, and they're driving by every day and you're looking at it and you're thinking, that's a nice car. And every time you go and turn your car on, it's like it makes smoke signals. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you try and start it. 
mm, mm, and you get so mad and you yell at it. Why don't you start you stupid car? Uh, I'm trying. I'm trying. And it's not starting. <laughs> and then you see somebody driving by waving at you in his new car. And you want to get a rock. You know, envy is, is, is terrible. It's, it's worse than jealousy. Jealousy is being upset that somebody has something that you want. Envy is a little deeper. It's... It's somebody having something you want, you wishing that you had it, and they didn't. It's a little e more evil in that way. We put it aside. Why? Well, once again, it destroys fellowship. You see, envy will rise, a, rise to evil speaking. That speaks of backbiting. Again, this is a sin that destroys fellowship and community. In the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 16 do not go about spreading slander among your people. Now notice, Peter doesn't tell his readers to fight against these evils. He says, lay them aside. How can I do that? Well, I put off my old nature, and I have the new nature in Christ. I recognize these things as sin, and if I'm guilty of them, I confess them, and I forsake them. And so I lay those things, I say, I don't want this, Lord. And some things, I, I'll be honest with you, I've been a Christian for a long time, and there are a lot of times that I'll say, Lord, I want this thing in me to die. So don't get dis discouraged. It, it sometimes takes a long time. And, and uh, I just encourage you in that. You see, he says, as newborn babes, verse 2, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. It's interesting he uses babies as an illustration. Why is that? Well, he's making it very clear that the writer is writing to those who are still young in their faith. He, he, he's speaking of sins that reveal that they are lacking spiritual maturity. And so what's the answer to the spiritual immaturity? Well, if you want to grow in the Lord, an appetite for his word accomplishes that. Now, Peter stated they were born again by the word of God. So he's speaking to them as believers. He's referring to living a new life. He's saying as Christians, you need to desire the food that is suited to their, their new natures, your new nature, because spiritual food is required for spiritual maturity. He speaks of it as the pure or the genuine milk of the word. One of the things I discovered when, when we began having babies, Marie discovered this quite obviously before I did, men are not always as sensitive as we should be. You know, the baby's crying and the father says, I got to get up in the morning, I got to go to work. You know, take that kid in the other room, please. Um, <laughs> but we can be that. Now, maybe you are not that way John was. I... I <laughs> But you, and, and Marie will say, she doesn't feel well. Well, how do you know that? I mean, how do you know that? She can't talk. She can't talk because she's not feeding. What do you mean? A sign that she's not well is she's not hungry. So that's how you check your own spiritual life. How hungry are you? How hungry are you? Because when a baby's ill, they don't want to eat. But if they don't eat, they get sicker. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, how can I put aside these things and grow into maturity? Like babies need mother's milk, you need God's word. There's a gauge. No hunger no life. Little hunger, little life. Growing hunger, growing life. You see, babies make their hunger known with the demand, and it reveals an active seeking for nourishment, not simply a passive expectation. And some babies, some babies have great appetites. When my firstborn, Corinne, as a nursing baby, she just was one of those babies that had to nurse forever. And I remember I went to work. I would leave at like 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 
And I, w- I worked close enough to where I was living to come home for lunch. And I still remember one day leaving early, you know, earlier to go to work with Marie nursing Corinne. I came home for lunch. And Marie was still on the couch nursing Corinne. Like three and a half, four hours later. And I walked in. I said, what's that? She goes, watch. Watch what she does. And she pulled the baby off of her. And all of a sudden, she goes, ah. And the baby starts to scream. She reattached this thing. (laughs) I said, that's okay. I can make a sandwich. (laughs) And I went and I made my own lunch. I went back to work. I got off at four. I came home as God is my witness. Marie was still on the couch. It's like a spider had sucked all of her moisture out of her. She's all like that. She wanted, ba- she wanted uh, to be nursed, and she was a healthy baby. Well, that's how, it, that's how it works with us, really, is that we nurse, and there's a passionate desire for the Word. We actively pursue it. It's like Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found. I ate them. Your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. I'm called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. When the psalmist was writing concerning the word of God in Psalm 19, verse 10, speaking of God's judgments, he said, More desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. In Psalm 119, verse 97, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Psalm 119, 101, I have kept my, I have kept my feet from every evil path, so that I might obey your word. Psalm 119, 103, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And so God's word is what feeds us. It makes us strong so that we might spiritually mature. We want to grow spiritually. You see, as a mother desires to see a baby grow, God desires us to grow. God desires us to grow. Birth is not the ultimate level of growth. Just because I was born again doesn't mean I've reached maturity, right? I need to develop spiritually to mature, and that takes time. And getting saved isn't the whole journey. Getting saved is the beginning of the journey. That's why in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, he says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why Paul in Ephesians 4.15 said, Speaking the truth in love, we we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. I used to say it like this, and it may be be, um, not the best illustration as I think it before I say it, but, you know, when I was a young person and I... I, um, went to college, you could get a degree, a bachelor's degree in four years. Some got it earlier, but four years. And you're a bachelor of whatever it is that you want to be. If you take a couple more years, two years, maybe three, you can, you can have a master's. And that's, we can say six or seven years, right? So you went to College, you got your bachelor's, you got your master's. If you pursue it even further, and depending on your study, uh, within uh, nine or ten years, you can have a doctorate. So within ten years, at just a normal pace, not trying to go too quickly and, and not just taking few classes, a normal pace, just a full load for all the semesters or quarters or whatever. Within ten years or so, you can have an advanced degree. And I began to think about that at one time, and I thought, gosh, I've been a Christian a lot longer than 10 years. But in many ways, I still haven't reached my bachelor's. And that was a challenge to me. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be diligent. Spend time. Meditate on God's word. Put it into practice. 
See, the best way to know the truth of a scripture isn't simply learning what the Greek is or the culture or the history. The best way to know is to do. This is how you know is by doing. Jesus said, if you do what I command you, my Father and I, he said, will dwell with you and we will manifest ourselves to you. It's in the obedience to what you know, not just a collecting of information. And I think that's where a lot of people make mistakes is they think that because they can quote a scripture that they know that scripture, and that's simply not true. Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you what? If you do them. Again, I've shared this with you before. I'll say it quickly, but to the Greek, the act... The uh, accumulation of information was regarded by them as knowledge. So the more information you accumulated, the more studies you had, the more things you learned, they would say that you had knowledge. But the Jew didn't think that way. The Jew would say, no, it's not the accumulation of knowledge, it's the usage of knowledge. Because it's in the doing that you have the knowing. That's why Jesus said, if you know these things, blessed are you, if you do them. Blessed is the one who knows and does, not just knows, because we know more than we do. And that's just a fact. And so what we have to do is we have to put into the practice or practice what we know. There's so many things that my dad tried to teach me as a kid that I wouldn't listen to. It's like Mark Twain paraphrasing him. He said, when I was 17, I thought my father was an idiot. But when I turned 21, it's amazing how much the old man learned in four years. <laughs> and, and, and I was kind of like that. What does my dad know? You know, you don't know the 60s. And so now we have younger people are saying, what do you know, you old fossil you, you dinosaur? You haven't got a clue what we're going through. No, well, maybe I don't. I don't know. All I know is I wish I'd have done the things my dad told me were best to do. I'd have saved myself a whole lot of pain, a whole lot of pain. He knew what he was talking about. And so it's not the uh, acquisition of knowledge, guys. It's a putting into practice those things that you've learned. And it's learning by doing. And that means that you're growing. That's what spiritual maturity is. It's not the capacity to sit down with somebody in a group and quote a scripture and have them all look at you like, oh, you're so wise. Because sometimes people think, no, that's a, no. if you don't do what you're saying, you go out and they see you doing something else, you're just a hypocrite to them. It's teaching what you're doing and doing what it says. And it's desiring his word so that your life can be transformed. Because, I've said this before, it's because it's kind of like something Barry Maguire, none of you will remember, some of you might, he sang a song in the 60s, Eve of Destruction and this and that, while well, he got saved. But the way, one of the ways that it worked was that there was a guy named Arthur Blessed, and Arthur Blessed used to hang himself on a cross in Hollywood on on. Uh, Hollywood and Vine, out in that area. And Barry McGuire was walking by one day, and Arthur Blessed's on this cross, and he says, are you ready for Jesus? And Barry McGuire says, he looked at him and said, I'm not even ready for you. What are you doing, you know? <laughs> and so he came to faith in Christ, Barry McGuire. And I heard him speak at a church one time, and he was saying, yeah, after I got saved, because he was well-known in the music industry. He says, after I got saved, he said, I had people saying to me, yeah, yeah, you've been brainwashed. You're just brainwashed. And I loved his answer. He says, yeah, you're right. He said, my brains were really dirty, and they needed a good washing, and they were washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, right? So that's what the Word of God does. It washes your dirty brains, you know, washing... Uh, by the word, Ephesians 5, the husband is to wash uh, by the water of the word. He washes his wife. We give the word of God. We live the word of God. You see, and that's what makes us spiritual leaders. And so it's, it's more than simply, I got saved December 27th, 1970. It's did I grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ over 53 years. 
or else I'm just a 53-year-old person who's just still an infant. And you can point back, oh, I got saved in this and that. But if you're not living as if you're saved, no. That's why he says, if indeed, verse 3, you have tasted, that word tasted, if you have fully tasted, that the Lord is gracious, if you've experienced salvation, then you have life. And if you have life, you have hunger. And the deeper you go with the Lord, the hungrier you are. You've enjoyed this wonderful meal of salvation. Enjoy tasting it. Enjoy tasting the goodness of the Lord. Like it says in Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Here's a cultural illustration and we'll close. When I was a little boy, I was raised on Menudo. It's in my blood. But my dad took me to a supermarket one day. And as we were walking by the meat section, there was this gross-looking stuff. And I said, what is that? And my dad said, son, that's Menudo. I stopped eating it. I stopped, I, it's true. I stopped eating Menudo when I was four years old, five years old. I said, I ain't going to do that. So I went into the military. I get out. I'm dating a young woman who became my wife, Marie. It's her birthday. And I take her out for breakfast. And I'm sitting across from her in a Mexican restaurant. And she orders Menudo. <laughs> and I look at it. And I said, you eat that? She goes, you don't? I said, are you kidding me? I said, I haven't eaten that stuff since I was four years old. And she says, really? She gets a spoonful and puts it in my mouth like I'm a baby. (laughs) And like, God showed up. I mean, it was... (laughs) It was delicious. And I said, I haven't had this... I don't remember the last time I had this. Taste and see. (laughs) That verse means something to me. That's why I gave it to you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. He is so good. And that's why we love his word. That's why you came on Wednesday night, right? We like to have fellowship. We want to learn to love one another. And we want his word. Because it changes our lives.